this video is burdened with glorious purpose. The talk about Loki. Hi, and to those of you who are new, welcome to the channel where I talk about arms and armor intersecting with LGBTQI heritage, women's history, and pretty much whatever I want to talk about. And today I want to talk about Loki. That's right, the charismatic comic book villain whose popularity has only skyrocketed since his inclusion in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and who last year benefited from his own spin-off series. I just sound like Loki's PR agent now. And it's difficult not to see Loki's appeal within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As the god of mischief, he's either a delightfully entertaining villain or an interesting, compelling, ambiguous hero. If not, a bit of both. It's kind of difficult not to gleefully anticipate how he might double cross his so-called allies, or even his own brother Thor. Or, you know, especially his own brother Thor. And overall, he's a great example of a character whose reinterpretations and reimaginings are so fascinating and multi-layered. From the point of view of conversations around gender and LGBTQI representation alone, there is so much to explore there. And we will. We will explore that. But what I really want to explore today is what weapons does the God of Mischief wield? So let's get into it. And let's start with the Norse mythology that inspired the creation of his character in the first place. Norse mythology can generally be defined as the body of myths of the Norse Germanic people, including Scandinavian folklore. A lot of it was transmitted via oral tradition, not just written text. So for example, the Edda that we're going to be talking about as 13th century text is one of those main bodies of text, but there are many more, and the stories that we find within the Edda actually have a much more ancient origin. So just like comics, while a vague canon may be followed, it also has lots of different versions and reinterpretations of the same stories and the same characters, including Loki. And the general consensus in these texts about Loki is that there is no consensus, because Loki is an incredibly complex and ambiguous character. Because of course he is. Loki's inherent nature is to make everybody's life complicated. Even historians. Especially historians. But here's a few things we can more or less agree on. He's generally defined as a trickster god, which generally refers to a character who is a clever, holds special knowledge and, well, enjoys tricking people. Basically just an agent of chaos going around causing drama. And this definitely comes across in Loki's numerous, numerous shenanigans with, alongside, and often against the Norse gods. And even as a god his status is kind of ambiguous because he is actually the product of both a god or an Aesir and a Jotun or giant, as they're usually referred to, entities that are presented as natural enemies of the gods of Asgard. So already from the start, Loki is kind of between two worlds, a little bit of an outcast, and doesn't really quite fit in to either category. And all of the stories that he's generally in show that. He's either an enemy of the gods of Asgard, an ambiguous ally to them, or kind of both. Either way, Loki is clearly out to disrupt things as much as possible by using all the mischief at his disposal. This would eventually escalate to a point of no return, which we will address later on in this video. I know, building suspense, you'll keep watching. How manipulative. Such a Loki move. Within his very core as a millennial old... I always do this. Imagine a millennial Loki. Technically, a millennial Loki would be as old as I am. Within his very core as a millennia old character, Loki is associated with the very start with cunning and deception. And this has translated on screen today with the weapons he's most associated with. And for Loki in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that weapon is the dagger. The dagger in itself is quite an ambiguous weapon because of course it is. Why would I make my life any less complicated? It can sometimes be difficult to define what is a dagger and what is a really 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 short sword. But the general consensus is that it is a small knife with a very sharp point. While some daggers can be used for cutting motions, the way many of them have evolved has been to maximize efficiency in thrusting motions. In short, to stab. But it wasn't only a secondary weapon used in military fighting contexts. 
its use as a stabbing weapon and its small discreet size meant that it was also used by civilians to carry out assassinations quickly, quietly and efficiently. And so, while in some cultures and contexts, the dagger may be associated with heroism, its popular association with literal backstabbing came to associate it with deception, untrustworthiness and treason. So if you wanted to depict a character as armed and treacherous, you might want to go with a dagger. So while Loki in the recent series might tell you that love is a dagger, you might also say that a dagger is betrayal, or at least associated with it. Marvel also had other reasons to include daggers and knives in general, which includes throwing knives as part of Loki's arsenal of weapons. Tom Hiddleston, Loki's actor, explained that the ideas of daggers and throwing knives came from understanding what Loki's fighting style would be like. Thor was like a block of granite, but Loki was like the wind. You couldn't really pin him down. Thor was solid, stable, immovable and enormously powerful and Loki was dancing around him like a sprite or as unpredictable as the winds. So if anything, I think it's interesting from a fantasy fictional point of view to understand how you're designing or adapting a character who's going to fight and how it's more complex than just giving them a sword. What does this weapon say about them and their personality? What does their fighting style say about who they are as a person and how they go about confronting or avoiding their problems? But in the Loki series, and spoilers ahead if you haven't watched it yet, Loki is entrusted with a new weapon by one of his variants from another timeline, Kid Loki. It's, it's a whole thing. And this is Levitin, whose name roughly translates as Damage Twig. Da -da. Yeah, I know, a bit underwhelming, but we'll get to it. When we see Levitain in the episodes, it is a sword whose blade can erupt into flames, which is incredibly cool. I mean so to speak. And this is not new in Marvel canon. In the series Loki, Agent of Asgard, Kid Loki also summons it for a fight, and it's defined as Loki's ancestral blade. But to find out more about this weapon's origins and inspiration, we need to head back to Norse mythology. Because what Levitain is in that context is complicated and ambiguous, because of course it is, it's a Loki weapon. So it's meant to be forged by Loki himself, and its purpose is to slay a rooster. Okay, that also sounds underwhelming, but it's a special rooster. That probably doesn't make it much more exciting. That is the rooster Vitopnir, whose slaying will allow for the hero to achieve his desired quest. The original mention of it is in the poetic Edda poem Fjövinsmel. The problem is, this poem is in Old Norse. That in itself is not a problem, but the issue arises in that it has lots of different translations and interpretations, including around the particular nature of the weapon Levitin. And so this weapon has been interpreted in different translations as different things, including being an arrow or dart, a cudgel, or indeed a sword. And for some scholars, not only a flaming sword, but the very flaming sword wielded by Serta in the destruction of the world, aka Ragnarok in Norse mythology. Serta and his flaming sword also feature in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in Thor Ragnarok. Not really a spoiler because it's literally right there in the title. And within Norse mythology, Loki has an important part to play in Ragnarok. In some versions of its story, it has a specific pact with Serta, and in other Germanic versions, while we're on a subject of fire, is often represented as a spirit of fire. I mean, he's also in other versions represented as a goblin, which... same. But here's where things get interesting with Levitin. Some interpret the literal name of Damage Twig as a kenning for a sword, a kenning being essentially a complex metaphor that stands in for another word, but for others, Damage Twig is actually a little bit more literal and refers to a wand or a magical staff. And various translations and interpretations have also defined it a deception wand, or wand of destruction, which already sounds a little bit cooler than Damage Twig. Taking it a step further, some scholars interpret the weapon as being a staff that is specifically used to practice seder, 
the type of magic used in Norse mythology and usually tied into knowledge around knowing and shaping the future. It can be used by both genders, but is generally practiced by women. And in fact, there was quite a significant social stigma around men using Seder. These men were generally referred to as being elgi, having elgi behavior, which essentially means acting in a way that is feminine. And at a time in which gender was conflated with sexuality, indicated a man in a passive role in a relationship. And this wasn't just a neutral observation, this was meant to be pejorative, indicating somebody who didn't conform to gender norms and was meant to be quite a serious accusation. So it's interesting that Loki, in many versions of this story, crafts a tool associated with Seder, given that he both gets called out and calls out other gods for not conforming to these gender norms. In the poem Loxena, he essentially crashes a banquet and starts insulting other gods, which is the biggest Loki mood of all time. Facing all these accusations on their behaviour, the gods respond that, hey, wasn't Loki a milkmaid who bore children underground for eight winters? That's not very gender conforming. To which he responds, hey, the god Odin uses Seder, which makes him gender non-conforming as well. So let's unpack all of that because Loki's powers include the ability to shapeshift into any form, and those forms can include a woman. And this features in some of Loki's most defining stories, including the one that ended up blacklisting him from Asgard as a definite enemy of the gods. And this story, as it's told in the Prose Edda, is this, that the goddess Frigg is a slightly overprotective mum who makes all living and inanimate things promise that they will never harm her son, the god Baldur. But there was one exception to that rule. Mistletoe. For some reason. But that wasn't accounting for someone finding a sneaky loophole. And that person? You guessed it. Loki. He takes on the appearance of an old woman to essentially get the gossip on the mistletoe from Frigg. He then makes a spear, or in some versions an arrow, from the mistletoe, and at this point he goes to the spot where the gods are um, enjoying throwing various weapons at Baldur to just enjoy seeing them bounce off him without harming him, which, hey look, the gods of Asgard didn't have Disney+, Plus. there are only so many ways you could entertain yourself. Loki then manipulates the god Hudr, who is blind, into directing the weapon at his brother Baldur and gets him to accidentally slay his brother in the process. So technically the mistletoe spear or arrow is a Loki weapon, even though it's not one that he uses himself and instead manipulates someone to do his dirty work. And there's a later instance where there's this new loophole in which if every single being cries about Baldur's death, then there might be a way of bringing him back, but one entity doesn't cry, and that is a giantess, except that the giantess in many versions is actually just Loki in disguise. So it's just Loki creating a huge problem and then being like, no, no, I'm gonna double down. I really don't want Baldur back. Just pure chaos, pure evil. I love it. And the Loki story can also include other gender non-conforming queer elements, like that time recounted in the Strindsvida when Thor wanted to get his hammer Mjolnir back from the giants and had to dress as a woman to pretend to go through with a marriage that is seen as the deal for returning the hammer to him. I think there's lots of interesting ways in which you can interpret that story, but in itself the whole situation in the poem does play out as the tired trope of a man in traditional women's clothing played off as comedy and something that contrasts Thor's masculinity with the disguise he has to wear. And also just to specify, Thor is definitely not happy about it, he's kind of begrudgingly doing it, it's not kind of, I'm really owning this outfit, it's more of a kind of, I really hate having to be unmasculine. It was tired in the 13th century, it's tired now, let's just take the whole tired transphobic trope and put it in the bin. Thank you. But I'm telling the story regardless because it has a queer silver lining, because Thor is accompanied in his adventure by Loki, who, unlike Thor, who openly resisted the idea of wearing women's clothing and openly expresses the fear that he will be 
feminine and therefore acting in an Ebergy way, Loki willingly offers to go with him, posing as his maid, and convinces him that this is the best thing to do in the long run. And some translations of the story suggest that while Thor is being referred to throughout with he pronouns while in disguise in women's clothing, Loki as a woman is referred to as such throughout by the narrator while speaking or acting in this role, leading to this interpretation that while Thor is clearly just taking on the appearance of a woman temporarily, Loki's gender presentation but also identity has shifted in that moment. By the way, just to add a little bit of nuance to this, I think lots of people have actually reclaimed this whole story from Thor's viewpoint in more positive ways, in terms of having a slightly more positive spin on being able to own your masculinity while wearing dresses, which is great and which I did want to acknowledge. Maybe the story has been positive to different people in a way that wasn't necessarily embedded in its original intention. So I just wanted to highlight that. These stories all highlight the nature of Loki as inherently other. Even in stories where his shapeshifting is used as a weapon to actually help other gods rather than harm them. Case in point in the story where Loki solved an issue with a builder and his stallion demanding payment for the construction of a wall to protect Asgard, distracts the stallion by turning himself into a mare and later gives birth to an eight-legged horse. This horse, Sleipnir, is only one of Loki's many monstrous children and there is definitely this implication that anything that Loki creates in terms of his descendants is inherently other and monstrous and only serves to kind of highlight his marginal different nature. All this to say that Loki is not only seemingly very comfortable taking on feminine roles and different gender roles and being referred to as such, but his entire status in a sense is queer, in a sense in which he's on the margins, he's kind of in between two worlds, he has a very very ambiguous slippery nature in general. But you might be saying, Claire, does this necessarily make mythological Loki gender fluid. Well, they're friends, enemies, arch rivals. There would have been no way at the time, obviously, to account for gender fluidity as a term, but something can exist far before it is defined as such. Even the concept of gender identity and sexuality is something that is defined within one person and not just within a series of separate acts and contexts is relatively new. For example, the term heterosexuality itself is actually a 19th century invention. It didn't mean that heterosexual people didn't exist before, but it also meant that things were a lot less strictly labelled and defined than they are today. So when we're talking about people who may have been on the LGBTQI spectrum in the past, we really have to consider that a person wouldn't necessarily have seen themselves as only one thing at any one time. So just an interesting thing to bear in mind when we see these different references to ergi, gender nonconformity, and different gender presentations and identities in things like North mythology. So I don't have a fixed answer because there isn't really one, but I think that all these stories show that there is massive room for interpretation. And I think these stories show that when it comes to Loki's gender presentation and identity, to riff off a famous Loki quote from Thor Ragnarok, you could say that it varies from moment to moment. But on that point, the Loki from the Marvel Universe is canonically gender fluid and pansexual. He's at some point reborn as a woman and his gender fluidity has been expressed and acknowledged by himself and other characters, including his adoptive father, Odin, who refers to him as my child who is both son and daughter. So all in all, within the comics, it's generally confirmed that Loki can take on any form as long as it's still him as a person. And to some extent, this is referred to in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Kind of. Alongside the existence and premise of a Lady Loki. In the series Loki itself, spoilers if you haven't seen it yet, a variant version of Loki from another timeline is a woman, although she prefers going by the name Sylvie. And by the way, Sylvie has a sword, so she's technically a sword lady and I'm very happy about that. Before the series Loki aired, 
a screenshot from it showing a file that indicated Loki's gender as a fluid led many fans to speculate on whether or not that would be explicitly addressed in the series. And there were quite a lot of positive conversations around Loki's canon, gender fluidity and pansexuality as a character. And just to talk about what Tom Hiddleston has said on that point, it's always been there in the comics for some time and in the history of the character for hundreds if not thousands of years. When it comes to the series Loki itself, it's an interesting one when it comes to making that queerness explicit, in that it doesn't really. While the director and lead actor's commitment to Loki's identity is great, the representation on that front in terms of actual on-screen content is very blink and you'll miss it. When Loki and Sylvie, or Lady Loki, are talking at some point, she asks if he's after a princess or a prince, to which he says a bit of both. And in terms of that shot that shows a file that indicates Loki's gender as fluid, well, yeah, that comes across a few times in terms of the actual series episodes, but only as something that is written down is never really actually talked about out loud. All in all, both of these references are quite easy to overlook. And even the presence of Lady Loki or Sylvie is a little bit strange because it's great, she's a great character, but her presence and her identity as a woman Loki is seen as a bit of an outlier. There are no other women Loki variants and her presence is even kind of offset by the existence of other slightly more absurd Loki variants such as Alligator Loki and don't get me wrong, I love Alligator Loki but it almost comes across as this idea of oh yeah, I mean Loki could be a woman but Loki could also be an alligator, how quirky, instead of acknowledging the idea that Loki could be taking on different forms because Loki is a gender fluid character. So I love the series in itself, I would give it an A for just overall great story, great character development when it comes to Loki, music, design, cinematography, everything, but when it comes to actually following through on that queer representation and that exploration of that aspect of Loki's character, I would say a B for could do better. So Loki has his own weaponry, both within Marvel canon, Norse mythology and a bit of both. But the resistance to his adaptation on screen being portrayed as explicitly gender fluid or queer, beyond a few easter eggs and offhand remarks, requires our own set of weapons. Knowledge weapons. To equip ourselves with knowledge that queerness in history and folklore extends far beyond the labels we use today, including the word queer itself, to parry assumptions and to fight for representation, within and beyond the subject of Loki, North mythology, Marvel and TV. Thank you so much for watching, if you like this video you can like or comment and if you're new here and like the general Loki vibes you can also subscribe. Stay safe sword lovers and see you in another video.